This is Bounty, the Safari Ace Podcast. I saw somebody dip a thermistor into cold water, into ice water, and a real-time cooling curve was appearing on the screen, and it blew me away. So Ray Kassar, Ron said, I watched him. He opened the safe, and he pulled $200,000 in uh, bills out of the safe, and he handed it to the woman, and he said, please say no more. I'm Kevin Savitz, and this is an interview episode of Antics, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. Atari Lab was a hardware and software package for the Atari 400 and 800 computers. The Atari Lab starter set with temperature module was released in 1983. The light module add-on was released in February 1984. Atari Lab was developed at Dickinson College under the direction of physics professor Dr. Priscilla Laws. Dr. Laws joined the faculty at Dickinson in 1965. She has dedicated herself to the development of activity-based curricular materials and computer software to enhance student learning in introductory physics courses, which started with Atari Lab. This interview took place May 14, 2015. My um, title right now, because I am an old-timer who is retired from teaching at Dickinson College, but I have been doing grant-supported curriculum development work. And uh, I would guess that computer-based curriculum development with Atari Lab was my very first uh, part of uh, doing this sort of thing. Can you tell me how that project came about? Yeah, yeah. This is kind of a little bit of a long story, but... Basically, my my husband and I had designed an energy-efficient home, and we wanted to put it under microcomputer control. And this was actually before Apple and Atari computers were on the market, and Commodore, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, prior to that, people were using single-board computers. And uh, I had then been programming a solar uh, water collection uh, device uh, using an old Rockwell AIM uh, board computer. And so I was getting, you know, all up into that. And as part of that project, I was meeting with some people at an organization called Technical Education Research Centers in Boston, Massachusetts. Well, it's actually Cambridge. And uh, I saw... The Apple computer had just come out toward the end of the programming that I was doing, and I saw somebody dip a thermistor into cold water, into ice water, and a real-time cooling curve was appearing on the screen. And it blew me away because when I was had been teaching physics labs, introductory physics labs, the students would spend all afternoon getting a cooling curve. And I re- and I immediately recognized that, hey, they could do things like, what if you dip it into oil instead of water? How is that going to change the cooling curve? Or what if you put insulation around the temperature sensor? How would that change the cooling curve and so on? And so students could be doing a whole series of experiments instead of the tedious process of uh, putting um, a thermometer in cold water and watching it heat up slowly or putting a a thermometer in uh, hot water and watching it uh, cool down slowly and so on and taking data every few minutes. and, And so you got one cooling curve in a whole afternoon and I was immediately thinking gosh think of all the experiments you could do in that same amount of time so I got uh, started experimenting with uh, using that in the uh, lab uh, with devices and by that time the Apple computer and the Commodore and Atari computers were on the market or were beginning to come out and so I just this led me not only to 
uh, initially trying to work with Atari because my son had an Atari computer. By the way, his name was Kevin also. But uh, what what Kevin and I did was was play with things on the Atari computer, and I ended up just calling Atari and asking if I could, you know, speak to somebody there and said I'd be interested in developing curricular materials for younger kids Mm -hmm. to work with the Atari computer and uh, various sensors, the key ones being temperature and light at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Um, So I got some investment capital from the college, and we started developing the Atari lab for them. And I, uh, we're back east here in in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So I ma- t- made many trips to California, which is my original uh, home. Anyway, I grew up in San Francisco, but uh, at any rate, we ended up making a temperature uh, thing a unit with various a- pieces of apparatus, as you know, mm-hmm. and a. Uh, an instruction manual for doing different experiments, and then did one on light. And uh, um, toward the end, Atari was having so much competition and kind of getting in trouble because they had been riding very high on being the first out with a game unit, Mm -hmm. as you know. So um, we never really, it ended up that they sort of backed out of things toward the end, and I I also then made the same kits for Commodore uh, through a third-party company. And uh, so I don't know if there are any other questions you have for me. Oh, I do. Do I ever have questions? Um, Okay. (laughs) So did you, um, so you and your team created the hardware and the software? Yes, basically. Wow. Now, creating hardware, I mean, we were using uh, sensors mm-hmm. that were already available. And just inter- and, interfacing them to the... To the yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I had, amazingly, I had a middle school student who uh, was extraordinarily smart, and he did most of the programming. Wow. So, Amazing. His name was David E. Golf. He, he uh, got... Uh, ended up taking a lot of courses at Dickinson before he graduated from high school and going to Vanderbilt and getting an undergraduate degree in three more years after that. And then on, he got his Ph.D. at Vanderbilt, and he teaches at George Washington University right now. Hmm. So, awesome. Yeah. So you, you did the, the, the prototype. and I mean, tell me about going out to Atari and showing them what you had and well, How I, does that work? Uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, I would go out with the equipment, and uh, we would talk to product manager out there. Uh, um, and her name was Leslie, and she was very sharp and very supportive. Mm-hmm. And also uh, there was somebody who was uh, one notch higher from her that was involved in, in product acquisition and so on. And uh, I worked with the the two of them and uh, gave some seminars out there uh, about it, got advice about, I mean, it was even things like how do you package it and how many uh, activities do we need to make a a decent size booklet for people and so on. Neat. And there was a, in the article I read that kind of made a big deal about how it was easy to use and it was color coded and you know, for different sensors, and which you know, it's a beautiful little product with the color coding and everything. Did did you did your team have input onto that sort of? Design? Oh yes, oh yes, yes. We even went to Taiwan at one point really? and uh, worked with people in a factory. <laughs> huh. So, wow. yeah. Was was there talk of potential other besides the light and the temperature of other modules? We we really didn't. There weren't um, any other sensors right on tap at that point in time that would have been inexpensive, relatively inexpensive, and easy to use. Mm-hmm. Uh, early on, uh, after light and um, temperature, there was a uh, 
a motion sensor, which was ultrasonic, and it's still being used very extensively in education. Uh, it sends out um, an, an ultrasonic pa- pulse and then records how long it takes for that pulse to get back, and then it can be graphed in real time. I mean, this is the thing that uh, for both the Atari temperature and light and the later motion detectors that were used long after Atari Lab came out it is the fact that you can see the graph growing in real time. Mm-hmm. And it's just stunning. So uh, we've we've used that since in uh, because I moved on to developing curricular materials at the college level that kept becoming more sophisticated as newer computers and sensors became available. Mm-hmm. So right now, um, here at Dickinson, for example, we teach a course that uh, I was took leadership in developing called Workshop Physics, and we completely abandoned lectures, and the students uh, come for three hour, two three hour session. I mean three three two hour sessions. I'm saying it bad, bad, backwards. Three two hour sessions a week instead of attending three lectures a week and going to a three hour laboratory. Mm-hmm. And instead of listening to lectures, we have an activity guide uh, which allows the students to work in teams of three or four to teach themselves physics by doing it. Wow. It's all hands on. And um, there have been a lot of, uh, there's a lot of educational research that has gone into uh, looking at learning games and so on. So there have been various, I've worked with uh two other colleagues from different institutions who developed something called the force and motion conceptual evaluation that we give to students at the beginning of the course to to see where they're at. It doesn't count on their grade. And then we give the same exam at the end of the course to look at uh, how much knowledge they've gained from where they started as a class. And uh, given this workshop physics materials, which are really takeoffs on what we did with the Tari lab, at least for the temperature and light, uh, we find that um, in the case of mechanics, and also we have similar exams in thermodynamics and in circuits and so on, uh, that the learning gains are just way better than uh, people get in lecture courses. Students don't learn from lectures very well. <laughs> Were you happy with when the Atari Lab came out, were, were you pleased? Did it do what you oh, wanted? Oh, yeah. Did you use yeah. it in the Yes, in class? at that time. And, and of course, Atari, as you know, had a special um, graphic system, which was ahead of the pack in, ter- in, ter- in terms of uh, how uh, the graphs were created. Mm-hmm. And I, I, it's been so long that I can't tell you exactly what the technology was about, but... Uh, Atari had much better graphics than its competitors in, in its day. Yes. Did, did Atari pay you or pay the college? Do you have any? Can you? No. The, how... the way it worked is that I got no pay from Atari. Mm-hmm. Uh, we basically were uh, had a contract to develop the materials for Atari so that Atari would own the product. Mm-hmm. Now, they went bankrupt before we finished, so uh, I think whatever, I don't remember the details, but whatever legal agreement we had with them, um, I ended up, the college ended up having rights to the materials, and so we were working with Commodore Computer uh, for a while and, and with the Apple people. So I was un- unaware that there was a, a Commodore or Apple version of of this of yeah. similar product. Well, we were starting to develop an Apple version, but um, that never came to fruition. But we did have an, a Commodore product also. What was so, that called? Do you remember? I don't remember, but the, we were not working with Apple directly. We were working hmm. with another third-party company hmm. right. on that. And I can I can probably send you some information about that. All right, what haven't I asked you about the, the Atari Lab that I should have? Tell me a story. Oh, jeez. I'll tell you a story. Well, what, one of the things 
I don't, I don't know if you want this angle or not, but uh, one of the things that intrigued me is that um, the early computer industry was very male dominated. Mm-hmm. And it's it's even true now. I mean, there are, there are more women going into programming and, and, and things than there used to be. But it's still kind of a, a male enterprise. Sure. And I remember that when I was giving a, sur- a survey, I'm not a survey, a uh, seminar uh, in the early days, and uh, there were a whole group of Atari people that um, – I guess their managers wanted them to learn about what we were doing. And I was explaining something about why we chose a certain sensor. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy there who was had this very uh, kind of a masculine chip on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to embarrass me. And he was saying, well... Why did you use this chip rather than that one? And uh, I can't remember the technical details at this point, but we had thought that through, and so I gave him a a, a very complete answer, and he kind of shut up. <laughs> but he was sure I was going to say I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> so, nice. and I said, "Gosh, I haven't encountered that before." <laughs> That was just one case. I mean, many other people were quite gracious. And the product manager, there was a woman named Leslie, and I can't remember her last name. I think she Wolf. Was, Might have been Leslie yes, Wolf. Yes, Leslie Wolf. Have you talked to her? No, she's on my list. She has not responded to my You should uh, talk to her. Inquiry. Yeah. Anyway, she was, um, uh, I, there was something, she was a, this incredibly can-do person. So if if we needed something and people were saying, oh, that's not available. <laughs> Leslie would come back to me and say, you know, I explored the warehouse and got the guy from the forklift to move a bunch of stuff over, and we found exactly <laughs> what you need kind of thing. <laughs> so she was one of these incredible make-it-happen people. Nice. So I um, had a I lot will, of fun working with her. I will redouble so. my efforts to talk to her. Yeah, yeah. The original project officer... Uh, at Atari, my my liaison person was a guy named Mike Nalbla. Um but he wasn't technical. He was more uh, managerial, and he, he wasn't. Um, he was one of these people that kind of got behind on things. Mm-hmm. So uh, he was very interested in the product, and I think we got um, enough attention from him, but. Uh, I noticed that there were a whole bunch of other things he wasn't attending to. So he didn't have quite the smarts and and, uh, ambition that uh, Leslie had at that point. So Um, There were some scandals. Have you gotten into that? Tell me. I I might might have heard the stories, but, uh, you know. Okay. All right. Um, Well, I have two two related stories. Uh, Actually, my... Dealing with Atari led me to uh, uh, meet uh, an engineer named Ron Budworth. I don't know if you heard about him. He was their acquisitions manager uh, in the early days at Atari. They had created the game unit and they were developing some other products. And so he would uh, go to, he was the head of engineering, I believe, and he would go to Taiwan to contract for parts to help them um, meet with factory representatives in Taiwan. And and they still had child labor there. So when I went to Taiwan once as part of the Atari lab, watching 11-year-old girls going to work, it's kind of disturbing (laughs) in this country. But at any rate, Ron found out that uh, some of the vice presidents were taking extra money, uh, they were getting payola from some of the factories to choose their factory rather than the most competitive factory in terms of quality of product and so on. Mm -hmm. And Ron became very disturbed about this because it meant that they were acquiring substandard parts and that approval for this was coming through various vice presidents, and Ron was not at the vice president level. Mm -hmm. But he went to one of the vice presidents, and he said, 
some of the vice presidents are uh, taking extra money on the side to choose companies that are making substandard parts. And Ron, very, he said, I very naively did not realize that the vice president that I was talking to was involved with this. <laughs> and what happened was there's something in Taiwan called the Black Watch. And uh, they, it turns out that one day he was in a subway station in Taiwan and somebody shoved him onto the tracks when a train was about to come in. Hmm. And they were wearing black outfits. I think this is why they were called Black Watch. And Ron was able to scramble off the track in, in time to keep from being hit by the train. But he then uh, went into hiding for a while because um, he was afraid that uh, these vice presidents who were involved were still going to try to have him bumped off. Wow. Now, what happened was that uh, he was also... He was self-taught. He never went to college, but he he went to UC Berkeley for a while on a scholarship, but dropped out. And um, he was a self-made man in the sense that uh, he taught himself uh, how to do the engineering. And and part of it, um, this is how he got hired by Atari, and he learned a lot more about computer engineering and at that point i had um i knew, i had a, established a relationship with ron he was living in silicon valley and he uh designed an interface for me when we started using uh atari computers in the uh, laboratory at dickinson for mm -hmm. teaching introductory physics i went back to my introductory physics teaching and and was developing these laboratory activities, which grew into uh, what I was telling you about before, our workshop physics course, where I eventually, after two or three years of using sensors in the laboratory, I realized um, that I needed to get a grant, which I did from uh, the Depart U.S. Department of Education. I got a grant to develop the course called Workshop Physics that allowed us to teach physics without lectures. Be, because they could use computer um, technology and and direct observations mm -hmm. uh, instead of listening to lectures. So what happened was we needed an interface. And I went back to Ron, and he designed uh, an interface that um, I and another colleague, Ron Budworth, and a third person ha helped with specifications. And uh, it turns out that the third person uh, wanted, could see that this product was going to be valuable mm -hmm. and turned on, on Ron Thornton and myself and said that his organization that he was working with uh, uh, owned the product because they had given, uh, they had made up the specifications. Well, Ron Thornton and I said, gosh, it was a three-way thing. The three of us were sitting down and saying, what kind of specifications do we need? And I think it's ridiculous for you to say that you own it. Mm -hmm. And um, I got a legal notification from him that um, that he and a couple of his colleagues at this organization owned it. And I went to the attorney I had worked with uh, during the days when we were doing negotiations with Atari on on the Atari Lab materials, a very, very good attorney, turned up with a case that went to the Supreme Court, which was as follows. Uh, if you are an independent contractor, as Ron Budworth was at that point, because he mm -hmm. was no longer working for Atari, if you're an independent contractor and you make something in your own shop uh, and have just been given um, brief specifications, not a full diagram like here's how I want you to wire it and everything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that um, – you can sell that product to the person who originally said, I'd like something that does ABC, uh, but you still own the rights to it and can sell it to somebody else. Mm. And the precedent for that was that some sculpture, sculptor or something developed a memorial for Martin Luther King Jr. in mm. the South, 
And another organization after this memorial uh, sculpture was done by this this guy in his shop, another organization wanted a similar sculpture in another town. And the people who had the first uh, sculpture that was a kind of a monument to Martin Luther King said, hey, you can't do that. You made that for us. Mm-hmm. And the, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, apparently, and they they said, if you are an inventor or an artist and you create something in your own shop without being given ex, um, explicit instructions mm-hmm. or following explicit plans, you own the rights to what you've done, and you've really sold one of the versions. Mm-hmm. So I went back to... Uh, another company, Vernier Software and Technology, and I said, you know, we have a really good interface. I I demonstrated it to them, and I said, this fellow, Ron Budworth, uh, owns the rights to it. And um, they ended up uh, uh, having Ron modify it a bit for their purposes, and uh, their business grew extremely rapidly. Um, because of having this interface, and we were using the interfaces in um, our laboratory. And the reason I wanted Vernier Software and Technology to do it is we were telling our friends, you know, we have this great interface, and Ron Thornton was using it up at Tufts University, too. We have this great interface, uh, and people would say, well, can we get some? So I'd call up Ron, and he'd send them out however many they wanted, and he'd sell them to them directly. And then people would call us back and say, it's not working. Well, you know, like one of ours isn't working or something. What do I do? And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't want to be in business like this. Uh, I want somebody else to take care of that sort of thing. So I put Ron in touch with Dave and Christine Vernier because I knew they were setting up a software hardware company um, for educational purposes. And it turned out that they bought units from Ron and resold them, and he kept them in repair. I mean, he you know, was able to work with them, and they sold something like 200 and, and uh, oh, how many units? Wait a minute. I'll, I have the note on my door. I'll tell you how many units they sold before it died. Hang on. Okay, the device was called the ULI, Universal Laboratory Interface, okay. and they sold 40,000 of them before it got superseded by new technology. Wow. And um, they gave us a a $10 fee every time they sold one, and I put the money in to our other grant project to develop the course that was using the ULIs. And now we use uh, much more modern ones because you know how the technology changes rapidly. But um, the acquisition of that unit... Uh, by Dave and Christine Vernier was the thing that helped their company just expand really rapidly. And they now have about 200-plus employees, and they're the leading supplier, I think even worldwide, of sensors and interfacing for computer data collection. Hmm. You can look them up on the web. I will. (laughs) It all started with the Atari. Well, so it was it was quite a story. Yeah, it all started with the Atari Lab. Nice. Now I have no idea what would have happened if all that hadn't come along. There'd probably be another story and <laughs> you know equivalent technologies and everything. And I am not a technological expert. Uh, I did put our house with a Rockwell AIM sing, um, single board computer. I did put our house under. Uh, computer control, our solar water collection uh, system. But um, I'm not a a real computer techie. I'm, you know, my basic instincts are with how to use it for teaching. Yeah, it's been a, it's been quite a ride because it had such an impact on uh, the ability to to teach in a way that's very powerful. And uh, a lot of people are using uh, much more in the way of sensors and computer technology in the labs. It's now just standard. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah. well, you know, I've heard a lot of stories about 
parties and about um, the things that are crazy craziness at the tar- parties and people blowing money on on expensive cars and stuff. But you're 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 the first person to tell me a story about a target management trying to kill someone. So oh, <laughs> congratulations. Well, there is a there's another um, bad story about Atari. Uh, I'll tell you. <laughs> Um, okay. this, Ron Budworth, he's no longer living, so I can use his name, but Ron Budworth, who designed this, the uh, interface and so on, while he was uh, chief engineer at Atari, it turned out that there was a problem with the uh, game, the original Atari game unit, which mm-hmm. helped the company expand like crazy. And this is, and it may have to do it may be related to the fact that there were some substandard parts in it, hmm. but it turned out that the computer unit, the game unit, uh, ha- ele- electrocuted somebody's dog. <laughs> uh, I guess the dog was sniffing around and it wasn't uh, properly shielded. Mm-hmm. And so it it had the potential to do the same thing for, say, a kid. Now, right. obviously, that that wasn't a common um, problem. But Ron said the president, uh, Ray Kassar, is that mm-hmm. his name? Yes. Uh, and and a bunch of engineers and executives would go on walks to talk about what to do about this situation because Ron said they didn't want to have um, anybody hear this. They thought, you know, that it's an outside chance the office might be bugged or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they would go for these walks and say, you know, how are we going to deal with this? And um, at one point, uh, Ron said we were back in the office, and here was this woman who said she wanted to sue Atari because her dog had died. And, of course, they thought that a lawsuit over this issue would just, you know, blow Atari apart, would just blow sure. them out of the water. So Ray Kassar, Ron said, I watched him. He opened the safe, and he pulled $200,000 in uh, bills out of the safe, and he handed it to the woman, and he said, please say no more. How's wow. that for a story? <laughs> Quite a story. <laughs> Yeah. So. Well, thank you so much for your time. Good talking to you, Kevin. Good talking to you. Thank you so much. Right. Bye. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.